Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this morning for our consideration is taken from the letter of the Hebrews. We read from the fourth chapter, begin with the first verse. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let's be careful that none of you be found at fallen short. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I've declared an oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest. His work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day God rested from all his work. And again, the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today. When a long time later, he spoke through David, as was said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, the text that we have before us this morning, the Greek is not necessarily difficult. It's the putting the Greek into English that is, is understandable. Start with a couple terms. Rest comes out a number of times in this reading. Rest, the word that is used there, means a, a habitation or a dwelling place. And so we get the greater context of our text is speaking of a permanent dwelling place that will be there for whoever. And then the text defines that, who that dwelling place is for. And it uses examples of the Old Testament with Joshua and with the promised land that was promised to the children of Israel. It again reaffirmed the promise that was given to David, and then it reaffirmed the promise that is the new gospel, the, excuse me, the new testament, the new covenant of believing in Jesus Christ for him and for our salvation. And then that becomes the whole context. God wants us to be certain of one thing, and that is there is a dwelling place for us after this life, heaven. He wants you to be absolutely certain of that. And then he says with words twice that come up in our text, be careful, be on guard, so that you do not lose that promise that God has given to you. And then he uses examples of how that promise was lost. He goes back to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. God promised them that he's going to take them to that new land. Where there they were going to worship him and it was going to be their land. They were going to be free from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And on that glorious day when they finally were freed from that slavery of Egypt, how much joy there was in the people's hearts as they were rejoicing and leaving Egypt. And the Egyptians were giving them some of their spoils to take along with them and so on. I would venture to say that a great majority were so overcome with joy. But yet, as we always know, there probably were some that had all right in Egypt. They had learned the system, learned how to get around certain things, and, and so on. And so, always is the case, isn't it? And so, as those years of wandering, that always amazes me. They come out, and here's the Red Sea. Here's the Egyptian <laughs> charioteers coming behind, ready to slaughter them all. God opens the sea, and they come across and dry ground. And the chariots come after them, and the sea closes on them, and everyone's destroyed. God had rescued them and saved them from ultimate death. And a few months later, they're building a golden calf, wishing they were back in Egypt. Who could understand the mind of man? Who could understand the sinful mind of man? How quickly we forget. How quickly we could turn on our Lord. 
And that was the case for the children of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. You know, what, what was it? Was it just a, an unbelief in God? I think you have to always go back to the root. What is it that causes people to drift in their faith life, to, to become very dormant in their faith activity? It's a lack of a love for God. That becomes the root of everything. A lack of love for God makes me indifferent at best to hearing his word and doing what his word commands me. Indifference to God and a lack of love for God makes me, you know, yeah, if I worship, okay. If I don't, that's okay too. No big deal. I'll go next week. Um, all, all those are the beginning signs and steps of, of unbelief. Is someone completely lost with that attitude? I can't say that. But we are certainly beginning to drift. And as those children of Israel went through the wilderness, there were tough times. There were difficult times. There were times that they were worried about food to eat, water to drink, and much less the idea of trying to get along with a couple hundred thousand people. That must have been a real scene as well, the arguments and the spats and the disagreements and so on and so forth. All of which led to one final, very real fact. Many did not enter the rest. Namely, many did not enter the promised land. Had they loved God? Had they served God? Had they obeyed God? That was the covenant. And so the writer of the Hebrews warns us, don't be like them. Maybe they'll become indifferent to your faith life. When you begin and when you sense yourself beginning to wander and stray from the Lord, get back into his word. Make use of the sacrament of Holy Communion. Be reassured again of God's forgiving love in Jesus Christ. Partake of his body and blood, together with the bread and wine that is given and shed for you, to remember what he has done for you and for your salvation, so that you don't slip and fall and fail to enter into that rest. It's always amazing to me as well how two people can hear the same message. Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross. He shed his blood to pay for every single sin I have committed, am committing, and will commit in the future. And that I have my salvation in him. Someone can take that and just love it and embrace it and say, you are my Lord and my Savior. All glory be to you. And another person hear the same thing and they say, you really believe that stuff? That's for naive people. That's for, that's for not thinking people. That's not for people that have intelligence. That's, that's naive. Be careful, the Lord tells us. Be careful with these things. Many are those that would try to rob us of our salvation. We could become very puffed up too. I was... One of the top ones in my class in catechism class. I memorized all those doctrines. I memorized all those verses and everything. So what? What do you mean, so what? Should have told me that before my catechism classes. <laughs> you're not going to enter the rest because you have a lot of things memorized. There's only one way you're going to enter into the rest, thing into heaven. That's through what Jesus has done for you and for your salvation. Memorizing those verses and those teachings of Scripture help to strengthen the faith and the love that we have for God because we see His hand at work in every single aspect of our life. Then we begin to realize, Lord Jesus, you are my life. My life revolves around you. You live in me through and through. And we realize that to be the case. But yet, it becomes very popular. Well, how we worship, or what manner of worship, if we use a liturgy, if we don't use a liturgy, if we use praise songs, if we use the violin or the guitar to accompany, and all these things become issues that really are not issues. Who are you worshiping? Why are you there? Why are you here? It is the recognition of what God has given to me in my Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Don't talk about sin, Pastor. Don't talk about repentance. You make me feel bad. You make me, you, I'm supposed to feel good when I come out of church. I'm supposed to be built up. If we don't know repentance, if we don't find ourselves on our knees asking God to forgive me, a sinner, how can we ever appreciate the shed blood of Jesus Christ? And how can we ever appreciate what he and his great love did for us? How he gave the ultimate for me, a sinner. And so we recognize that. And to realize that our faith is all about Jesus. Now my sinful flesh always wants to put up that shiny object before the Lord and says, see how good, see how good, see how good. Look what I do. I'm not as bad as them. I'm not as bad as them. It doesn't matter if you're as bad or good or anywhere in between. It matters if you recognize you need what Jesus has done for you. See, faith is what makes the difference between those two people. Faith receives. And then I read the pages of Scripture, and I read that Jesus was nailed to Calvary's cross, and as he bowed his head, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. It is done. I recognize that not as just a nice story, not something that makes for a good movie, but I recognize he did that for me. He did that for me. That's taking what we're told in Scripture and taking it to heart. The Lord speaks to us through his word, is how I introduce the readings on a Sunday morning. Because that's exactly what he is doing. The Lord speaks to you through his word. And you realize he's speaking to me. It's kind of like taking that next step. If any of you have worked in teaching or coaching or anything like that, you're telling the ones in front of you all these things, and some are just there just hanging on every word. And the others are, you know, watching the butterflies and kicking at things and so on and so forth and, and such. Hey, I'm talking to you. That's what the Lord is doing. I'm talking to you. Listen to me. Hear my words. And when you combine that with faith, it's like, Lord, you have done this. The rest. There's a lot in this text that is, it's, it's difficult to put into English. It's difficult to, to really get the, the mind of the writer, what he's trying to tell us. I just like to look at it this way. Heaven is going to be a place that is going to be so absolutely wonderful that you cannot even describe it right now. It, it'll be better than you ever thought. It'll be better than you ever even imagined. To be with the Lord forever and eternity. I think of all the Cubs fans among us this morning. What did it feel like back in October? They finally did it and you're just like, wow! All those years, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if they won? I can just imagine how I'd feel if they won, but they did. You get a glimpse of what real joy is. In the same way as we look forward to heaven, we have these ideas. No more suffering, no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more pain. But it's hard to imagine that because I have my aches and pains. You know, life isn't always so fun here on this earth. It's all stress and people don't get along. Can't go to the coffee shop anymore because politics comes up and everybody's arguing. Life isn't always so fun. Oh, the joy and the bliss of heaven. See, the text makes it clear. There is a heaven. God has prepared that for you. When those children of Israel set off from Egypt not knowing where they were going and God promised some place that they were going to, they didn't even know it existed. They probably had an idea it did, but they didn't have any idea about it until they entered it. Then they knew. See, we live by faith, not always by sight. Well, prove heaven to me, Pastor. Prove it. I don't have to prove it. Because yeah. I believe it. I believe it with every fiber of my being. <clears throat> That's the joy of our salvation. 
And the Lord says, there is a rest. And through me, enter that rest. Enjoy it. As we look forward to that time when we'll all rejoice around the throne, there'll be no greater joy. And that's what the writer and that's what the Lord is saying to us through this word. Embrace the gospel preached to you. Be careful. Be careful as to not lose it. It is possible to fall from grace. It is possible to, to lose everything. Sometimes, as those children of Israel, I'm sure some of those just plain got tired. I am tired of this food. I am tired of this journey. I am tired of these bugs in this wilderness. I am tired of this and I am tired of that. Sometimes we too, as we age, and when people say, ha, ah, the golden years, what's gold in the bottom? Oh, I, I dread them. Sometimes it's hard just, just to hang on in faith and to trust God's promises. But they're real. They're real. There's so much joy awaiting us that you'll never even think back. To many of the sufferings or the trials that you endure in this earth, because you have God's promise. And faith tells us and leads us to accept God and his word. And to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the salvation that you've won for us. And guide me and lead me into that promised rest. Amen. <clears throat> now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.